Welcome everybody, excited to have you in class today. My name is Kari Sotner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center. And this week, and I'm so sad to say this, but I'm also really proud of us, this is the last week of classes for this school year. And I am very excited because this might be so far my favorite class of the year, even though I usually say that every week. I'm saying that this week because we're looking at the Supreme Court cases this year and the four big cases. So it feel, feels very interesting. It feels very like hot and butt is issues in the Constitution. And shouldn't be, that be the conversation we end with? What are the big parts of the Constitution in the news, in our lives, and how to have a civil dialogue around it? Thank goodness we're here with Tom Donnelly, who's going to walk us through all of this. But please, as we go through, ask your questions. There were a lot in the last class, and there will be a lot today, because there's a, a lot of gray here, and it'll be fun to go through together. So Tom, I know we have a lot to go through. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. And give us, like, from your perspective, how hot do you think the Supreme Court season really is? Yeah, so this is one of the big terms. I mean, th there's always a few cases every term that are blockbusters we watch closely. But some are, there are blockbusters and there are blockbusters. And so this term really features a few really important cases that people are closely watching. Um, and so I look forward to digging into the arguments on all side, sides with, uh, with everyone here. Awesome. So I thought we would do a little foundational work, make sure we're on the same page, because it's really relevant to understand how does this work? How does the Supreme Court work? Who are they? Before we dive into the cases and talk about the people in the cases and how the courts are looking at the arguments that are presented in front of them. So let's begin with the Supreme Court and looking at the lineup of the judges that will, will have been listening to these cases all year. So Tom, why don't you walk us through who they are, kind of how they were appointed, and then we'll also clarify the changes at the end of this term. Absolutely. So yes, this is the, the class photo of, of the Supreme Court. Um, they are seated in specific positions based on their seniority on the Supreme Court. So this was not a photographer's aesthetic choice to put them in this particular constellation. Uh, but it begins with number one there in the middle, Chief Justice Roberts. He was appointed to the Supreme Court in 2005 by President uh, George W. Bush. Number two is the most senior justice that is not the Chief Justice, which is Justice Clarence Thomas, who was appointed in 1991 by President George Herbert Walker Bush. Number three, then, is Justice Stephen Breyer, who was appointed in 1994 by President Clinton. And then on one end there in the bottom row, number four is Justice Samuel Alito, who was appointed in 2006 by President George W. Bush. And then all the way on the other end there, the front line, is number five, Justice Sonia Sotomayor, appointed to the court in 2009 by President Obama. And then we get to the back row there. Number six, towards the middle, is Justice Elena Kagan, appointed in 2010 by, Justice, by uh, President Obama. Number seven, right next to her, is Justice Neil Gorsuch, appointed in 2017 by President Trump. Number eight, on one side of the back end there, is, is uh, Justice Brett Kavanaugh, who was appointed by President Trump in 2018. And then finally, number nine there, the back right corner, is Justice Amy Coney Barrett, appointed by President Trump in 2020. Awesome. And we always laugh that they're clearly not lined up by size and height. Um, and we're going to have a shift at the end of this term. So when Justice Breyer retires, we have a, a Judge Jackson that will be joining as a justice. And she'll wind up taking that ninth spot, correct? Exactly. And then, you know, every, everyone else will shift around as well. Kagan will be in the front row, and then we'll go from there, all that movement around. Um, it is a lot of jumping around and back and forth and back and forth, um, but it really helps to kind of look through and who they were appointed by. And Tom, as we kind of go through this, you know, one of the questions from the last class that I absolutely loved is when we talk about the courts and their role and the justices' role, how much, how important is it to really understand who they were appointed by and what's their role as Supreme Court justices. Does that really matter? Um, and in theory, does it really matter? In practicality of the way the American public sees the court, does that matter? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the great debates in political science for the last 50 or even more years is how much <laughs> the, the appointing president's politics matter uh, to how the Supreme Court decides cases. I mean, constitutionally, we set up a system where there is at least some connection between the presidents, the, pre the presidents that are elected and who ends up on the Supreme Court. 
Article two, section two sets out the appointment power of the president, which says that the president shall nominate and buy in with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint judges of the Supreme Court. And so there we see both the president and the Senate having an input as to who's gonna end up sitting on the Supreme Court. And because the justices serve for life, because they really serve until they retire or they die, um, there is a, sort of an inconsistency on how often we see Supreme Court vacancies. So some presidents get more appointments than others just based on how that ends up cashing out. And frankly, if you look at the court today, um, you know, with Justice Breyer retiring at the end of this term, the most senior justice is, is Justice Thomas appointed in 1991, but the rest of the court is really quite young by Supreme Court standards, with, uh, with Alito and Roberts being added by George Herbert Walker Bush in the aughts. So it's a fairly young court. Fantastic. And now, since you talked about, like, appointments for life, I thought we'd do a little, like, definition setting before we dive in and start with judicial independence, because they're connected. <laughs> So Article 3 of the Constitution lays out the judicial branch, which says it's, it's, it's going to create the judicial branch headed by one Supreme Court and in such, such inferior courts as Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Uh, but Article 3 also sets out some key principles. One of the big ones was the one you, you put on the screen just a second ago, Curry, which is judicial independence. And this is that idea that the federal courts must be independent from control of the other branches. And Article 3 does this by giving justices life tenure. So that's the idea that justices serve not for a set term, but until they retire or die. The only other way to get them off the Supreme Court is the difficult process of impeachment and removal. No justice has ever been removed through that process. And only one justice has ever been impeached. That was Justice Samuel Chase during the Jefferson administration. So it's been a really, really long time since then. But this general judicial independence goes to the idea that we want just justices and national and federal judges to be insulated from the political branches. We want when cases come before the Supreme Court or the, or the federal courts, we don't want political considerations to come in. We want the justices to be unbiased and to give their own independent judgments. And that perfectly leads us to judicial review. So they're, when they're looking at these cases, what is the idea of judicial review and how that works? What's the role it, as Supreme Court justices? Yeah, so judicial review is the big power that judges have, including justices of the Supreme Court. This is the power to review the constitutionality of laws, acts, acts practices of national, state, and local governments. So that's that power to say this is constitutional or this is unconstitutional. Awesome. And the last part, um, and I just absolutely love the way you explained this the last class. I want to make you do it again in this class is this idea of judicial supremacy um, when they're looking at these cases. So, yeah, so judicial review, again, is this idea we could say that the, the judges can say if something is constitutional or unconstitutional. Judicial supremacy asks like this next question. Um, and it's the idea that the Supreme Court is the final voice on questions of whether actions by the national, state, and local governments are constitutional or not. Some argue that that's true. Many argue that this is not true. And so there are big debates over judicial supremacy and how much Supreme Court decisions settle the Constitution's meaning. This is one of the great debates that Abraham Lincoln had before he was president, where the Supreme Court had the Dred Scott decision. Abraham Lincoln came out and said, yes, I honor that judicial judgment as to that case. I'm not gonna suggest violence or, or define what the Supreme Court said, but that doesn't settle for me the meaning of the constitution. The Supreme Court was wrong and this debate has to continue. And so there's this ongoing debate over how much the Supreme Court's decisions are final. Of course, the ultimate way in which the Supreme Court could get checked is through the Article Five Amendment process. If the American people and their leaders disagree strongly with a decision of the Supreme Court, we can pass constitutional amendments that say, Supreme Court, you're wrong, and to set the right answer. We did that with Dred Scott. That's the 13th Amendment, in many ways, the 14th and 15th Amendment. The 16th Amendment did that, giving Congress the power to uh, pass an income tax. So there are many times in history where we've used that power to check the Supreme Court. Fantastic. And I appreciate that we're teaching a class on Article 5 tonight as well. Uh, so working nicely. Now, let's jump a little bit to how a case comes to the Supreme Court. Because, you know, as we dive into just the numbers around this, that thousands, thousands of cases get to get a, sent to the Supreme Court, but they only typically see around 60 to 100. So can you kind of walk us through the process and then what's the norms around that as well? Yeah, so each year there's roughly between 7,000 and 10,000 petitions to the Supreme Court saying, Supreme Court, take my case. 
And see, so these are called petitions for a writ of certiorari. The Supreme Court these days really only takes between 60 to 70 cases each term, each year. So that's 60 to 70 cases out of 7,000 to 10,000 they could take. So it's a vanishingly small number of cases the Supreme Court takes. Um, you know, ultimately, when we're thinking about constitutional cases, these cases arise when, you know, either a group or a person steps forth and says something the government has done violates my constitutional rights. So it becomes, you know, in many ways, many of these cases start with we the people or me the individual. And so it's someone filing a case in the, you know, what we'll do is let's quickly trace through the different levels of the federal court system to see how it gets to the Supreme Court. If you're going into the federal courts, it begins with what's called a district court. And so there are 94 of these district courts in the country. You'll, you'll, you'll sort of state your case, usually over in front of a single judge, and that judge will decide who wins. The losing party can then appeal to the courts of appeals, which is that next layer of the federal court system. And so these, they, these courts are exactly as they sound. They are uh, courts that are hearing appeals from the district courts. There are, there are 13 circuit courts overall. 12 of them are distributed by geography, as you can see here in this map. And so the circuit courts of appeals will make a decision in your case as well. And afterwards, if you lose, you can then, again, petition the Supreme Court to hear your case. Again, the, the, the Supreme Court hears only between 60 to 70 cases per year. The way in which they come into a decision is the Supreme Court, if four of the nine justices say, I want to hear this case, so less than a majority, it's four of nine, the Supreme Court then puts that case on its docket and hears argument, and we can expect them to decide that case by the end of June of that term. Um, you know, this reminds us that the Supreme Court isn't there to decide every case, every issue. It's not there to even correct every error that's made in the courts below. It's selecting a certain number of cases that they think are important for the Supreme Court to weigh in with its authoritative voice. So when they're reading these cert petitions, what they're looking for are really two main things. One, in many cases, is this a, a, an issue of national importance? Is it really something where we think us speaking as the singular voice for the federal courts is important for us to weigh in? The other key question is, are there divisions in how the courts beneath us have decided this issue? These are called circuit splits, but if you have one circuit deciding X and another circuit deciding Y, the Supreme Court might step in and try to come up with one rule that all the circuits have to follow. This is the idea that we want national uniformity in the laws so that no matter where you're filing your case, the same legal rules will apply whether you're in Alabama or New York. And so that's sort of what the Supreme Court's looking for as it's deciding which case to take. Awesome. Now, clarifying, because I know this, we all talk about it, we're debating it in the chat right now, is this understanding that the Constitution lays out kind of the framework and the guidelines, but then there's other laws and acts and amendments in, you know, which go into the Constitution that, and then court cases that help frame out the rest of the Constitution. So this idea of judicial review in the Constitution, it's not specifically spelled out in the Constitution, but what establishes it as a part of the Constitution? What, what big case sets that up? Sure, yeah, there's no judicial review clause in the Constitution, uh, but you know, the big, so there are two big things if you wanna read about where judicial review comes from, one is a Federalist paper essay by Alexander Hamilton, Federalist number 78, uh, where he really explains both the importance of judicial independence to our system, but also both the legitimacy of judicial review and why it's so important. And then the key Supreme Court case that affirms the power of judicial review is Marbury versus Madison in 1803, which was written by Chief Justice Marshall. Awesome, fantastic, thanks. Okay, now, Four happens, they've got four that agree upon it, they got the 60 cases, and real quick, how come, how come it's so low and has it, like it's been low, it, it seems like the amount of cases they review each year are smaller and smaller. Is there a reason that that's happening? Is there a reason why that's happening? Uh, you know, not particularly. It's a matter of norms over time. So it's basically, you have to be able to get to four. Sometimes there are a variety of reasons why they may, might not hear a case, might not be important enough, may not have been litigated enough in the lower courts for them. Maybe the case that they're just not sure how the other justices will vote, so they're afraid to take the case. There are a lot of things that can curb it. But since 1925, so not for all of our history, but since 1925, there was a bill passed by Congress known as the Judges Bill, which was advocated by then Chief Justice Taft. 
which is where the Supreme Court gets control over basically deciding what cases it hears each term. Prior to then, it had to hear a ton more cases. In my period, I studied the late 1800s, the court was hearing over 1,000 cases per term, and they were really, really overloaded and like three years behind on their work. So there's always been a balance between wanting the federal courts and especially the su Supreme Court to hear important cases, but also ensuring that the work wasn't you know, was, wasn't overburdening them and, and really impossible to get through and that you couldn't really give due care to each case. Got it. Perfect. That's a great answer. Now, real quick, as we before we jump into is when we look at these big four cases that we're going to dive into the cases for class today, some of the top cases of the of the year. You know, we can always expect our Supreme Court justices to be experts in every piece of content. Um, we expect them to be experts in the Constitution, but sometimes these cases are a huge science conversation. Sometimes they're a huge tech, like some of the tech cases that come up around the algorithms of technology are unbelievably confusing. How do they prep for these cases? And how do the lawyers that are, you know, in the cases and trying to win the argument really explain their, their side and their perspective and the, the courts really grapple with this variety of cases they see in those 60 to 100 each year. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we often focus on the big constitutional ones, but in a way it distorts the work of what the Supreme Court is doing. The vast majority of its cases fall under laws passed by, uh, you know, passed by Congress. Um, uh, uh, and, and as a result, rely on like really having to understand really technical statutes. So not just sometimes scientific information, which you might have in like a patent case, but really just read the Clean Air Act. I used to do some environmental law cases. It's really, really complicated. And unless you're an expert environmental lawyer, it could be hard to see how the pieces work together. And so when the justices are doing their work and trying to learn about a case, they're, they're, they're mostly reading these briefs, which you see on the screen here, which are put, they're written by the parties in the case, so the people on the opposing sides, and then also sometimes briefs put forth by the, by the government, and also by different groups that are interested in what's happening at the Supreme Court. And so when we ask Justice Breyer when he's at the Constitution Center, what's your job like? What's it like being a Supreme Court justice? He'll often say, you have to read a ton. It's like, look, he'll point to his bag and say, I have a bunch of briefs in there. And so it's, they're relying a lot on the parties and the fact that the two parties have to argue with one another to suss out the best arguments on all sides and sometimes really understand what the issues are. So they're reading the briefs and then, then they have a, another opportunity to actually discuss the case with the litigants, with the lawyers in oral argument. So they read the briefs, then we hold oral argument. In each case, these, the, the, the parties are only getting under two hours to argue their case. So it's not a ton of time, but this allows the justices to probe what they think are some of the weaknesses in each party's arguments. Um, and also sometimes just to ask clarifying questions. Maybe something was unclear in the briefing. Um, and so they just wanna to try to hear from the advocates themselves what is going on and how they should understand it. So we have the briefs, then the oral arguments, then the justices meet in their private conference. And so this they do once or twice a week. And this is, a, this is their conference room right there. Only the justices are in the room. There's no clerks there. There's no staff there. And this is where the justices first go around the table and say, what do you think of case X that was just argued? And then they go around the table and, and, and give their preliminary votes. And through this, they'll determine who's going to write the majority opinion, who might dissent, who might write separately, write concurrences. If the chief justice is in the majority, the chief justice assigns who's going to write a, an opinion in a particular case. If the chief justice is not in the majority, then the senior most justice in the majority will decide who's going to write in a given case. Um, and then, you know, there's a there's between the, the conference and when an opinion comes out, there's then a great dialogue that happens inside the court where justices will produce draft opinions, circulate them to the other justices. The justices will give notes on those opinions, suggest ways to make it stronger or weaker. Um, eventually, once those opinions are really rock solid, and what's cool is like, once they're circulating drafts, the, the majority will get circulated, the dissent will get circulated, and then the dissent and then the majority opinion will respond to one another in the final opinion. So they'll revise along the way based on the best arguments on the other side. And finally, when this process is done, the justices have to say, I'm for opinion X or I'm for opinion Y, and they actually have to commit to their votes and watch all the justices have done so, an opinion is ready to be announced. Fantastic. And real quick clarifying question, because I, I don't really know the answer to this, but I love the question. Can, can you ever jump? Can you go from district court to Supreme Court? Is there like a way to jump the system? <laughs> You can, and they're so there. They're even so. This used to be much more. 
these have changed over time based on often laws passed by Congress. But there are some examples like, for instance, I think it's in voting rights cases, certain voting rights cases. They were actually heard uh, uh, in the first instance by a panel of three district court judges, and then it, it could be directly appealed to the Supreme Court. So there are some examples where you could sort of hop, you know, you know, hop a hop a court. But generally speaking, if you're not in, if you don't fall into one of those categories. The Supreme Court is generally going to want you to go through sort of the entire process, um, uh, uh, and, and because the Supreme Court, when it's trying to decide a case, um, even if it's a case where the justices may know the issues fairly well, they still do see value in the advocates going through each of these layers of the courts and also hearing sort of the how the courts decide these cases over time. It can help shape their own views on the best way to approach a case. So it's a, it's seen as like an iterative process where there is value to each layer for the Supreme Court itself to learn the best they can, the best arguments on each side of the issue, and also importantly for them, the problems on each side that they might have to solve, where there might be holes, where there might be difficulties. And that, again, so often we talk about process in these classes, no matter on what part of the government we're talking about. And we see this as, you know, slow deliberation and discussions and civil discourse. So the Supreme Court doesn't really want to jump ship because they're watching how the lower courts are handling it and and like an action of federalism too. How are the lower courts handling it and working out the, the kinks and the bugs to see what comes and rises to the top or where huge conflict is and they need to step in. Okay, let's dive to them stepping in and looking at, there's a lot of cases that come out every year. Um, they say they tend to save the big cases for the end of the term, which will be the end of June typically. These cases have not been out yet, but we're going to look at these four cases in a little bit different order. So we'll start with Carson and then go to Kennedy since they're all like First Amendment cases. So Tom, walk us through these cases. And one of the things that we talked about earlier was the government has violated my constitutional rights or an in, my individual constitutional rights or my collective constitutional rights. So kind of pull that out for us too as you break down the constitutional questions. Sure. So the two sides in this case are some families in Maine uh, are, are the challengers. They're challenging a Maine law and Maine itself is defending the law saying it's constitutional. Um, it involves, uh, it, in a way, sort of an unusual fact pattern. So there are some rural school districts in Maine that are so small that they don't have public high schools of their own. And so what the state says to families is you have two options in those situations. One, you can choose a different public high, a public high school in a different school district that's near you and you could send your kids there. Or two, we, the government, will give you government funding to, to go towards tuition in a private school. The big thing that's at issue here is that what Maine also says is the, ones, the one exception here is that government funding cannot be used for private schools that have forms of religious instruction. And so the challenges in this case are families who want to use the money from the government to send their kids to private schools that provide for religious instruction. Their argument here is that Maine's program violates the religion clauses of the constitution. Effectively, what it's doing is treating, it's, it's a form of religious discrimination, treating religious private schools differently than secular private schools. On the other hand, Maine steps in and they counter and they say, no, no, no. What we're trying to do here, this is a weird situation. There are some of our school districts that don't have public high schools. And so what we're trying to do is to provide funding that gives these students and families the same opportunities they'd have if they had a public high school in their own school district. In that case, what we're looking to provide them is funding so they can get secular instruction in a public high school. And so therefore it passes constitutional muster. It's not a form of religious discrimination. We're just trying to give them the benefit of the bargain they'd have in any other school district in Maine. Fantastic. Okay, now sticking with schools, a little theme here. Um, let's talk about, um, I feel like everybody just calls this the praying coach case. So can we talk about the praying coach case? Yeah, so this is a case, uh, Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. It involves an assistant football coach who at the end of high school football games goes to the 50-yard line, kneels, and gives a silent prayer of thanks at the end of the game. And the question is whether or not, and, and ultimately the school has said he can't do this. At a certain point, there's a chance to renew his contract. The head coach of the school says, no, we shouldn't renew his contract. And Kennedy himself doesn't apply for the position again. Instead, he brings this challenge in court. And the question is whether or not the school has the power to keep this coach from praying in this circumstance. There are really two separate sets of questions under the First Amendment here. 
One is whether or not the coach's speech here is his own private speech or a form of government speech. This matters because the Supreme Court's case law, including a case called uh, Garcetti, um, says that if it's government speech, the, 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 the government in that situation, this here, the school, there's no real protection for that form of speech. And so the school has a great deal of discretion to keep him from praying. If it's private speech, then it just has to be analyzed under typical First Amendment case law. The other question, though, is sort of under the First Amendment's religion clauses, Coach Kennedy saying that this action against me violates my First Amendment free exercise right. On the other hand, the school says, no, we're in a really tough position here because we're part of the reason that we're saying the coach can't pray here is because we have First Amendment concerns of our own. Namely, if we allow him to pray, we might be susceptible to challenges under the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment, saying that people might perceive us allowing him to pray because he's a coach for our school district, might perceive us as endorsing his religious prayer, his religious prayers in that context. So here it's a, it's a difficult constellation of issues under both the First Amendment's free speech clause, but also both religion clauses of the First Amendment. Fantastic. Now, uh, Ryan asked, a question for clarification. Was it a non I can't say it, non-denominational uh, prayer or was it one more associated with one religion? You know, the, the, whole, the whole premise, the, the, the specific issue in this case is whether or not he can give a silent, a, a, a brief private, private, private uh, prayer of his own at the 50 yard line. And so it's not as like, it's not a case where it'd be like over a loudspeaker or something like that. And so my guess, I don't know for sure. I don't know exactly what he's saying when he's at the 50 yard line, but I would guess it'd be something that's, you know, consistent with his own faith. It could very well be a sectarian prayer. I don't think for Kennedy and his, and, and, and his legal team in this case, it's not so much sectarian versus non-denominational as it is this act of what they describe as sort of a private quiet prayer at the 50 yard line. That's his own private speech. The other thing to note is, as you analyze this case, there's a great deal of debate between the two parties over the actual facts of this case and how they characterize the prayer. The coach is saying all he really wants to be able to do is to have this pri private, quiet prayer at the 50-yard line. The school district in this case says, no, if you actually look at the facts here, it resulted in a really ruckus environment where a lot of people joined him on the 50-yard line. And because of that, it raises some concerns for the school, both for the safety of students maybe being run over as people are joining him on the field, um, but also the, the, the question of whether or not students feel coerced into praying. And so it's this, it's again, this push and pull between different clauses of the First Amendment. But those are sort of the arguments that are being offered on, on each side. Fantastic. Um, and now our next case is the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association. Okay, so this is a this is a Second Amendment case, so dealing with the individual right to keep and bear arms. Uh, New York generally uh, uh, bans possession of firearms without a license, um, and so you know this case has to do with the permitting process for how one could go about getting a permit to carry a concealed weapon in public. The key background here is the Supreme Court in 2008 and 2010 decided two big Second Amendment cases, Heller and McDonald. In those cases, it set out that one of the core protections in the Second Amendment is an individual right to keep and bear arms for defense in one's home. Um, and what it did was it struck down two handgun bans, one in Washington, D.C., and one in Chicago. At the same time, what the Supreme Court said is the Second Amendment, like every other right, is not absolute. And so there's still the possibility for the government to regulate in certain contexts. So this case really has to do with you know, the natural follow-up question to Heller and McDonald. If Heller and McDonald are about the right to self-defense in the home, the question here is, to what degree do you have a Second Amendment right to protect yourself outside of the home? And so here, what the, what the, uh, the, the uh, challengers in this case are the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association, which is, uh, which is a firearms group in New York, but also some, uh, some individuals who had uh, 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 applied for a permit to carry a concealed weapon, that permit was denied. What they argue is that New York is giving too much discretion to the officials to decide whether or not to grant a permit. They're saying that under the Second Amendment, a permit here should be like getting a driver's license or even a permit to a parade. This, the officials themselves shouldn't have discretion to say yes or no, whether or not we really need it. What, they, what, what they're arguing is that the officials are really asking not just uh, you know, do you qualify in a certain way, but do you have a special need for self-defense? Is there a special circumstance why you need a concealed weapon? And what they say is in this context, in many places, it's virtually impossible to get a concealed gun permit. On the flip side, what the state says is this is a really old law. We've had it on the books for a long time. There is, you know, we, we recognize the Supreme Court had, you know, uh, had declared in Heller 
uh, and McDonald, this individual right to keep and bear arms for protection of one's home, that doesn't mean that it goes, that applies outside of the home. And furthermore, if you look across American history, there's a tradition in this country of some sort of gun regulation of arms outside of the home. And so those are sort of the two sides of the case. The, the, the challenger saying, no, the, the, that Heller and McDonald, the natural inference from that is that the Second Amendment right has to travel outside the home. And so a regime like this, which gives so much discretion to the permitting officials in New York, has to go. Whereas on the other side, New York is saying, no, 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 this is squarely the sorts of regulations we've seen over time in America. It's consistent with the text, history, doctrine, and tradition of the United States. And as a result, it should be upheld. And thank you so much, Tom. And it's really interesting how kind of you're breaking down both sides. And then you said this last class, and it was so important is, you know, no matter which way this case comes out, it's really the, the details, like the devil's in the details around it. And we were having a discussion about this on Monday, and it was the questions like, if it goes to striking down and you can carry concealed weapons outside the home, is there places that it wouldn't be allowed? So there's a, lots of layers to this. Uh, the person in, that was talking about it was talking about like the subway. Would the subway be in an area where it is because of the amount of people going that it wouldn't be allowed, even if it was said to be okay outside the home? So, so many interesting layers as we do wind up getting these cases in, reading them and understanding what do they say, how do they set things up, uh, and where they still put release limits and put limits as well. Now, the last case, we save for last because it's the big one we all want to talk about, and you guys are already asking great questions on it, so I'll weave them in. But Tom, give us the facts of the case, kind of lay this down for us, um, and then give us the, the cases that came before it and how this case connects to another case and overturning other cases, because it's a little different than the, the ones before. This one has a, almost like a domino, or could have a domino effect. Yes, yeah, so this is Dobbs versus Jackson's whole women's health. Uh, the, the, the specific question the court granted here was whether all pre-viability pre bans on abortion are unconstitutional. And then by the motion of the state of Mississippi, Mississippi also uh, asked the court to revisit and reconsider its precedents in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. This specific case deals with a law passed by Mississippi, the Gestational, uh, gestational uh, Age Act, banning most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy with some exceptions for medical emergencies or fetal abnormalities. The challenge was brought by Whole Women's Health, which was the only abortion provider uh, in Mississippi. The case as a whole, of course, deals with the constitutional right to an abortion. More broadly though, it, it gives rise to the, a, a question that has really been a big topic of debate among justices, scholars, and lawyers for generations. And that's how do we think about rights uh, you know, about how the Constitution might protect certain rights that aren't specifically written in there. And so these are known as unenumerated rights. The question being, does the Constitution protect rights that aren't specifically written in there? And if so, how do we discover what these rights are? Um, you know, the classic example would be something like the right to privacy. The Supreme Court in Griswold versus Connecticut said that a right like that is in the Constitution. That then, that Griswold ruling would then be the sort of the, the, the foundation of later the later decisions challenged here, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, where the Supreme Court said that right to privacy can be extended in the context of reproduction. And as a result, there is constitutional protection to a right to an abortion in certain contexts. And so this case is now asking the justices to wrestle with really two big, big issues. One is what's the best way to read the constitution? You know, if we're looking at the constitution's text history, structure, all of that is the best reading of the Constitution that it protects a right to an abortion or not. So the justices have to wrestle with that one substantive issue as a whole. But the other key question here is, you know, even no matter how you come out on that, that first question, how constrained are we as Supreme Court justices by previous decisions by the Supreme Court, including Roe v. Wade, which was decided 50 years ago? And so the justices have to think hard about the relationship between doctrine so like this end precedent, so this idea that, you know, we are bound to a certain extent by decisions we've made in the past and how that interacts with their best reading of the Constitution. In other words, for many justices, if they think that Roe v. Wade was wrong when it was decided, they still have to ask that follow up question, which is, you know, how wrong does a decision have to be initially for us to want to overrule it after many years? And for justice, for many justices, that's a difficult question, the interaction between sort of their primary reading of the Constitution itself and also sort of what they see as their, their 
their role and duty as justices to also think hard before overturning previous rulings of the Supreme Court. Thank you for ending on that, because that's a question that Barbara asked in the chat, but also um, was posed two days ago at our conference was, you know, we've seen, and there was a couple questions around this, we've seen cases overturn over other cases in the past. Um, one question was, when did that first happen? When was like the one of the earlier cases that overturned? I always think Plessy and Brown and how Brown overturned Plessy, separate but equal, is not constitutional. Um, and then uh, other cases. But So when was the first time it happened? And then how common is that? Because the question that Barbara asked is, if every new court over basically overturns the court's previous, how does that then have respect and legitimacy in the court? And the question that was grappled with at a conference I was at two days ago was, when do you overturn something because it wasn't the right constitutional law? And when do you respect the 50 years in between of all the justices who chose not to? So that's a lot to unpack there, Tom, but I'll give it back to you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's no easy question to any of the answer to any of those questions. I mean, as to when was the first first uh, instance of something being overturned, I really don't know the answer to that. All I would say is that, you know, just as 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 we're thinking about like the judicial power of the United States under Article Three, it would have been a common practice in the common law to, you know, for, for you would understand as a justice, there's always going to be sort of a combination of adapting old precedent and sometimes overruling. And it's just kind of what judges did from time immemorial in sort of the, the tradition that goes back into British, the British common law, which then became the American tradition. So there's nothing unusual about that, it just as a general practice. Uh, but it's not something that judges do lightly or do very often. What we see, if you look throughout American history, there are, you know, the, the Supreme Court, you know, maybe each term, the thing is like when they overturn decisions, sometimes it's really, really obscure decisions too. So I think if you look each term, there might be a case or two where they're overruling an old old decision, but it's not, it's not Plessy. You know, it's like there's, there's sort of a difference that way. But what you would see over time is that there are certain periods in American constitutional history where there's just more cases of importance overturned, often in a shortish period of time. So key examples would be, we see this during the New Deal era. So after 1937, once FDR puts you know, a lot of his uh, allied justices on the Supreme Court and a lot of the old justices retire. We see them reconsidering a lot of old precedent, especially expanding the powers of the national government to regulate the economy and even state and local governments to regulate the economy. So we see a lot of cases sort of overturned in that period. Another period would be during sort of the war and court era and the civil rights era. That's another period where you'd see a lot of cases overturned. So it's often a time where there's, you know, a great deal of political and constitutional change um, and sometimes also where there is, and it's, it's true with your question, where there is, you know, some turnover in justices, where you see a lot of new justices on the court. You know, a more obscure example would be in the late 1800s, a period I study, there's massive turnover between the Wake Court and the Fuller Court, and you do see changes in how the court approaches a range of questions during those periods. Um, you know, for an individual justice, though, it, it is very much, I think, as I described it just a couple of minutes ago, which is like, it's a constant question of you want to be able to sort of tick through all of the key methodological approaches you view as legitimate and see in which direction they're pointing the Constitution's text, history, structure, doctrine, tradition for some justices, prudence, morality, all of those sorts of things. Different justices draw on different of, different of those modes of interpretation, but you want to sort of tick through all of them and see in which direction they're pointing in a given case. And, and in you know, really difficult cases sometimes, what makes them difficult is that your reading of the Constitution's text, history, and structure may point in one direction, but the court's precedent, its doctrine, its prior, previous cases point in another, and you and a judge have to make sort of an independent judgment as to you know, which, which to wait in a given circumstance. I think each judge tries to come up with their own criteria that they can, they can apply consistently across cases so it's not just a matter of politics, but it doesn't uh, decrease the difficulty of how to do that over time. Fantastic. Now, I'm, what I'm going to do, because I know some of our students have to jump, I'm going to stop share and stop recording real quick, but then I'm going to tick through the tons